Okay, let's just go ahead and uh, talk about Jimna Kalitsu. Uh, basically, uh, today uh, we are going to talk about one of the uh, biggest uh, genus of cacti, uh, which basically stay like at the same level as other big genuses like Echinopsis, Mammillaria, Apuntia, Aesiza, etc. And uh, Without Gymnocalitsum, uh, the whole family of cacti will be definitely like uh, insufficient. And uh, we just decided to talk about it again uh, to bring your attention to this uh, marvelous plants. So if if you if you if you just start in collecting cacti, or if, if you if you don't know much about Gymnocalitsum, so I'll do my best uh, to fill this gap today. Uh, basically, why Gymnocalitsum? Because it's, first of all, it's a very big uh, genus of cacti growing all over South America. And you can find uh, any type of cactus plants looking at the Gymnocalitsum species, uh, different shapes, different spination, different flowers. And uh, what, what is also very important and why I'll try to bring your attention to the Gymnocalitsum species or genus is that they're pretty easy to grow plants. They're pretty durable, very tough. Uh, it's actually not easy to kill them even if you want to. So this why uh, I'm kind of uh, like <laughs> advocating for Gymnocalitsum species and uh, you can find seeds or plants on the internet and if you if you're interested if you will be interested in this species after, after in this genus after this presentation please go ahead and find it they flower all season long starting maybe late may and until late september you can see flower after flower sometimes bunch of flowers so very very nice plants very like uh, stable genus i mean like genetically stable I found it like, 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 like as I said, uh, very easy to grow. Just following a few basic uh, rules and techniques, which are basically common for most of the cacti. So let's just talk about genus. Well, as I said, this genus is very like big. It's a gig uh, gigantic genus. There are many uh, like estimations about the number of uh, species in the genus. And uh, some people are saying there are about 70, some are saying 190, depends how they look. I found one article where they listed like 900 plus species and subspecies of Gymnocalitsum. So you just should realize how big that group of plants is. Uh, just the most recent uh, publication, uh, which was updated from 2015, uh, it's, uh, it included uh, 60 recognized species and 18 subspecies of Gymnocalitsum. Uh, Gymnocalitsum can be found in uh, almost all over South America, but uh, mainly they grow in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay in this area. This area is pretty big. It uh, has like Atlantic Ocean uh, on the east and it has Andes in the west. And Gymnocalitsum obviously are growing from uh, low altitudes up to the uh, few, uh, few, uh, few thousand uh, feet above the sea level. And uh, that's why they are like, uh, so, uh, like so diverse. On top, there are many uh, hybrids now on the market uh, of Gymnocalitsum. One of the well-known is for sure, it's, it's uh, not a hybrid, it's a mutant of Gymnocalitsum, uh, Mihanovichai, which is a moon cactus. It comes to every nursery in different colors, red, yellow, whatever you find it. Uh, so, like again, uh, because of the big area, the uh, it explains the diversity of the plants in the same genus. But what is very common to the genus, to 
Because this genus is, is, uh, is a flower. Because uh, flower is very specific. Uh, the name uh, gymnocaritrum derived from the Greek uh, gymnum, which is naked or hairless, and hollux, which is goblet. Basically, if you look at the, uh, at the flower, you see that the flower tube or goblet is, has no hairs, no spines, just large scales. And this is common for each and every gymnocalitsum, if you look at any gymnocalitsum in the collections. Uh, common name of gymnocalitsum is uh, chin cactus. Also, it's one of the uh, uh, kind of like, like uh, specifics of the gymnocalitsum plants, which makes them so distinguished. If you look at the, at the body, at the ribs, you see that every like oriel on a rib is divided by very deep groove. On some species, it's, uh, it's, it's really deep. On some, it's just uh, not so deep. But again, it's, a, it's another uh, feature or like another thing which uh, distinguishes gymnocalypsum, any gymnocalypsum plant from, our, uh, from uh, other cacti, uh, which we can see in our collections. Uh, evolutionally, and therefore, like, uh, genetically, gymnocalitsum uh, are close to uh, three other genus uh, of cacti, which is uh, like uh, Wingartia, Sulcaributia, and Ributia, also from, uh, from the like, close areas in South America. Uh, you can definitely see some similarities in the flower. For, for example, if you look at a uh, flower of, uh, of, of Ingard, it looks like naked flower to you, but there are so many other differences uh, like between those uh, three, uh, three taxa and, uh, and gymnocaritsum genus that they are definitely not the same and uh, uh, you can tell the difference like immediately if you see gymnocaritsum in any uh, of those plants. Uh, just a little bit of history that uh, the first time uh, gymnocaritsum appeared in Europe as many other cacti in the beginning of 19th centuries. Uh, very first plant was described by Adrian Howard and obviously it was named just cactus, cactus gibbosum in 1812. And later, that cactus gibbosum became gymnocalitsum gibbosum, which we know right now. Uh, the name gymnocalitsum appeared first time in 1843, and uh, in the very first uh, like catalog, which listed gymnocalitsum as a genus of cacti, it was spelled slightly different. If you see. Uh, after L, there is no Y, it's I, but uh, we still keep almost like the same sp uh, spelling for 160 years now. Uh, so uh, in 19th centuries, most of the cactus or global um, or ball shaped cactus were called just Kihina cactus. And obviously, gymnocalitsums were among them. And there were uh, 12 species of gymnocalitsum known as the hinocactus at that time. Uh, and after that many years, uh, the name uh, of the genus gymnocalitsum wasn't recognized by botanists. And they will still keep calling it a hinocactus until 1922 when Britain and Rhodes uh, published their book, the Cactaceae, where they respected 23 species of gymnocalitsum as a genus, as a taxa. So uh, the good news about gymnocalitsum is that during that long history, uh, there were not too many merges or, or, or splitting or dividers uh, as many other uh, genus of cacti uh, uh, went through. And uh, basically, at least it makes it easier now uh, to say that gymnocalitsum is a well-known uh, taxa of cacti and uh, it's uh, 
pretty stable like genetically and uh, that's why i'm pretty positive uh, that uh, it will stay like that for like many years now because i i was reading like like lots of material before this uh, presentation i did not see any of them be mentioning that oh, okay we have to merge in the calypso like for example like with Ributi, or we have to split gymnocalizum into two different uh, taxa. No, I haven't seen anything like that. So easy. Uh, there are a few like uh, internal uh, moves inside the gymnocalizum uh, genus. For example, uh, there are a few uh, species of gymnocalizum which used to be like uh, separate species many years. And uh, recently, they merged into one genus, for example, as a, uh, one of the examples is uh, Gymnocalypton stegazini. I had like a bunch of plants, which I still call by the old names. For example, this used to be uh, Gymnocalypton cardinazianum. Now they say, okay, this is Gymnocalypton uh, <laughs> stegazini, subspecies cardinazianum. And the same for Gymnocalypton pulens. They moved it. Uh, I mean, they renamed it to the subspecies of Gymnocalypton stegazini. Other than that, there is no too many uh, interesting things about the, uh, the taxonomy. Just to illustrate uh, uh, the number of the Gymnocalypton species and subspecies, I just found one catalog from, 20, uh, from 2010. And if you just uh, look at the catalog, it has like, uh, let me see supposed to be a video, not sure why it's not playing. Huh. Just a sec. Okay, so I'm just scrolling it down and, 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 and you see there are hundreds and hundreds of lines and all of them are just gymnocalypsum, gymnocalypsum, gymnocalypsum and you can see references, uh, etc. remarks. So if you're really would like to be a specialist in gymnocalypsum, then you have to learn a lot about the, uh, like the species and the differences, etc. cetera. Uh, well, like despite that there are tens or maybe hundreds of species of gymnocalypsum, every genus of cacti or plants have type species. For gymnocalypsum, it's a gymnocalypsum gibosum. Basically, it's one of the first gymnocalypsum found and described, and it still stays, it still like, uh, represents uh, the genus uh, as a type species. After that, for sure, there were many other plants found uh, in, uh, in the habitat, and people still keep looking for a new gymnocalypsum traveling just across. Uh, South America regions where gymnocalypsums are growing. Uh, I just found a few recent findings, which is from 1999 was gymnocalypsum. Uh, then there were a few others found in, uh, and published in 2017. I found very nice uh, online uh, journal, which is uh, Schulziana, and they publish lots of materials. Basically, it's a gymnocalypsum journal. And every year they publish new materials about new travels, new findings, uh, the classification and taxonomy of gymnocalypsum, et cetera. So it's just not a, like, a, this is the open end and we still might see different uh, species of gymnocalypsum coming up. I was just checking that uh, uh, like online, if seeds of any of those plants are available and and surprisingly, I found that almost all of them you can purchase now, uh, mostly from uh, like European uh, catalogs. But if you're interested in something new, you can just take your time, go to Google it, and you can find it, I believe. Uh, so now let's just review the, like, the genus kind of in, in few steps. First, the flowers. It has all variety of flowers from white to dark red, a lot of pink, no yellow though. Okay, so this is uh, why gymnocalypsums never have 
yellow flowers, but uh, like, like again, all shade of pink, white are there. Uh, the dark red is a very beautiful plant. Uh, and uh, uh, for some reason, I have three of them flowering. I could not get them cross pollinated, but I, I keep working on it. <laughs> Uh, the shape of the flowers also is different. You can see that, for example, Gymnocalitum saglionis has very, very short flower tube, where Gymnocalitum uh, cardinasii or oregonesii has very, very long flower tube. The plant itself is almost flat. It's leveled with the soil, but it, it shoots at the tube like five, seven uh, cent, uh, centimeters up and uh, very nice, very interesting uh, species. Spines are also different. You can see, uh, for example, that uh, this is a picture of Gemnocalitzum uh, chicken danzii, which has very like, uh, like, <laughs> like offensive spinations. At the bottom one is Gymnocalitzum denudatum, which is almost bald, has just few spines, very soft spines. Again, uh, if you like spines, you can find at least 10, 15 uh, species of Gymnocalitzum with very strong and distinctive spines also. Uh, technically, uh, as I mentioned before, they grow in most of the uh, South American countries, but uh, Gran Chaco is uh, the well-known uh, Gymnocalitzum area. Uh, basically, uh, even in Chaco, what I mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, the climate zones and conditions are so, uh, so different. You can go from uh, low altitude on the Atlantic, close to Atlantic, to Andes, where it's pretty dry and cold. And uh, for example, in this small area in Chaco, uh, the rainfall is quite different. If you go to the east area of Chaco, uh, mainly Paraguay and Brazil, it's a tropical climate with rain, uh, rainfall up to 1800 millimeters a year, which is a lot. However, if you go just a little bit west, close to Andes, the rainfall over here is just 500 millimeters a year, which is almost four times less than the uh, eastern areas. And therefore the plants are different and the conditions are different, uh, even in this one particular area. Uh, soil, uh, mainly clay, where uh, Gymnocalitums are growing, uh, technically, uh, uh, the summer come like uh, it goes from December to April in uh, in the hemisphere, and uh, there are a lot of pretty dry places where gymnocalyptums are growing. Uh, so, but mainly in the western area, just along the uh, Andes border. Uh, just just a little bit of of details about uh, the taxonomy of Gymnocalitzum. I would not waste your time too much. Uh, basically, you know that uh, when you uh, look at any big genus, usually uh, you see uh, this uh, that botanists or scientists they divide them into the subgenus, which basically kind of like uh, represents specific group of plants like uh, within the genus. And then in, in some genus, for example, in Astrophytum, they do it based on the how the fruit split or whatever. Uh, in Gymnocalitzum, it's interesting, they do it uh, by the type and the shape and the size of the seeds. Basically, they divided all Gymnocalitzums into into five uh, subgenus based on the uh, uh, size, shape, and color of the seeds. Uh, 
like like again if you go to different uh, like uh, sources you can find different number of uh, groups or subgenus of gymnocalism in in one of them for example in new lexicon from 2009 i found six subgenus and and 13 sections within those subgenus so it's pretty complicated <coughs> Basically, just very briefly, uh, the very first uh, subgenus is uh, Macrosemenu, which definitely states for large and big seed size. Uh, geographically, this is uh, uh, the area of uh, close to the uh, to the uh, like Atlantic Ocean, pretty humid and warm, obviously, and uh, the like type species of this. Uh, Subgenus is Gymnocalypsum genodatum, which has really big seeds and by the way, it's self pollinated and uh, it's very easy to get seeds from the Gymnocalypsum genodatum species. Uh, next is basically Gymnocalypsum itself. It has uh, typical gymnos fruits, green or blue, seeds medium size, and uh, those plants are growing in different areas. Uh, in, uh, mainly in uh, Argentina. I have Gymnocalypsum bruchii, which also belongs to this uh, subgenus. Uh, number three is uh, Microsemenium. Obviously, it stays for small seed size. Uh, plants itself are pretty variable uh, in sizes and shapes, etc., but they all have very small, uh, usually black or dark brown seeds. And uh, as you see on the map, those plants are going from the west areas, which are pretty dry and maybe sometimes have a lower temperature in winter uh, months. Uh, obviously, one of the well known Gymnocarizum saglionis belongs to this group. And uh, I, I have plenty of seeds of. of, of of saglionis and it's really very tiny, tiny seed. Although the plant itself is pretty big. Uh, just another representative of the same group of the same uh, subgenus Gymnocalypsum glaucum. And uh, num number four is uh, Trichomatumenum. Uh, basically, it uh, represent uh, the plants. Uh, are uh, with very uh, small uh, body sizes, which are basically up to 15 centimeters only, uh, and mid sized seeds. And again, they're coming from uh, west and dry area of, uh, of Argentina. Uh, this is a, a typical plant of the subgroup Pichlianum. Uh, this is the one which I showed before, it's a Gymnocalypsum. Raganese, it's a very nice plant. And you see, as I mentioned, like exactly in the description of the group, the plants are very small, usually flat, but the shoot that uh, uh, flower, which is like many, many times taller than the plant itself. Uh, and, and the last one is uh, Muscosemenium, basically, this is uh, again a different uh, type, a uh, shape of plant, different sizes, but this group, like specifically, has seeds, beige brown, coated as always, uh, like uh, like a cow or something like that. Uh, and uh, the most well-known Gymnocalypsum probably is Gymnocalypsum Michanovici, which belongs to this group, and. Uh, I just have uh, seeds of that gym, uh, of the gymnocalypsum now in my greenhouse, and they're actually very tiny and uh, light, light beige seed size. Uh, basically, uh, mutants are well known among uh, gymnocalypsum. Uh, I mentioned that uh, moon cactus, which is uh, 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 which can grow on the uh, which can grow grafted only because it has no chlorophyll to feed the plant. But uh, there are lots of other cultivars and, 
uh, which are like available in the market. And this is the, uh, the picture uh, of the plant. I, I like, I have I purchased it a few years ago. And as you can see, it, it, it's so variegated, it has yellow, uh, red, and green. And because it has green, it obviously can grow on its own wood. And uh, I have two of them, and I was cross pollinating them, and I have seeds. <laughs> and seeds are seedlings, I actually shows a lot of variegation as well. Some of them from the very beginning, some of them start showing variegated colors maybe after two, three years when they reach certain size. But it's uh, uh, there are a lot of plants like that on the market which you can uh, go and, and uh, actually purchase them. Uh, any questions about Gymnocalizum as a genus, about taxonomy, groups, species? Because next we are moving to cultivation. No? No questions? Okay. So, uh, cultivation is pretty much straightforward. Uh, most of the gymnocarytsum present no problem in cultivation and growing well. And regular, uh, with regular reporting every two or three years, uh, many species start flowering at the age of two or three years from seed. Uh, most of the gymnocalitsum are solitary plants. So they can stay in that like 10, 12 centimeter pot for many, many years if you just change the soil uh, pretty often. Uh, there are only a few like relatively large species such as gymnocalitsum horsei, saglionis, castellanosei, Caridispinum, gibosum. So basically, the rest of Gymnocalizum can be considered as, uh, as a miniature plant, which you can easily grow on the windowsill, or you can grow them like 20 of them, 50 of them on one windowsill, which is for some people uh, will be an advantage. Uh, so else, okay. It's uh, I just just a little bit of the topic because uh, I was uh, I was reading lots of well, kind of like materials about genus and I found one book when they do like recipe for of soil for every single group of genocolites on different mixes different proportions but I believe it's pretty like kind of old approach because uh, now nobody's uh, uh, paying too much attention to the soil composition for each single plant or group of plants. Because like in the past, it was kind of almost a science where uh, all cacti grow has bags of different components and material and the mixing them and they're trying them and changing the mix for the next year because basically uh, soil mix was the only source of the nutrition. Uh, uh, for the plants, because uh, there were not too many like actually good uh, uh, fertilizers which were suited for uh, for succulents and for cacti specifically. But then the situation changed. Now you can go to any nursery, to any garden store, and find like lots of uh, fertilizers, like specifically for succulents, or even like flower fertilizers which are close to the uh, to the proportions of, of components which are good for succulents or for cacti. And that's why now people are moving mainly to the, uh, to, to the mineral type of mixes. Uh, humus is one of them. People use different, like tons of other uh, like mineral components. Uh, in, in my practice, what I do, I basically just, for mature plants, I still add some uh, some uh, some organic material, but no more than twenty five, maybe thirty percent of the uh, of the vellum. Uh, I use anything. I use like whatever uh, coconut compost or plain topsoil, or even like off the shelf cactus mix, which I just screen and and they use it. And the rest, I now I made in fumes because we have. Uh, 
cooking is available. Uh, I use coarse uh, sand, I, I, I use chicken grit, uh, like uh, kerlite, uh, vermiculite, whatever I found. So in my case, I, I just don't care about the actual like, proportions uh, for the mix. I just know that it must be very light, very porous. It should be perfect. Uh, to, uh, it should have perfect uh, uh, like uh, uh, drainage. And this is what the uh, plants need. There is no any 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 magic. Uh, I, like as I said, I still adding about 25, 30 percent of of, uh, of organic material mainly uh, for regrowing. Uh, Tiny hair roots after replanting, uh, like mainly for small seedlings. But if I'm replanting a big space, like specimens of, of Gymnocalis or basically any other cactus, I might just put it in pure uh, pumice and just it will be absolutely fine. Uh, as I mentioned before, Gymnocalisum. Uh, like frequent reporting uh, because they start growing much faster if you report them every two three years again my point is i'm i'm replanting my like mature plants only if i absolutely have to but if somebody wants to grow them big and fast then you have to report them every two three years at least when the plants are small or mid-size like five seven centimeters across when they reach bigger size, like 10, 20 centimeters across, I would not report them like uh, unless every it's seven, eight years at least. Uh, so this is what I, I say. This is a like, good combination of uh, soil, like, uh, soil mix and the fertilizer. Those are uh, seedlings of Gymnocalypsum Cardinalianum, which I sold in February 2021. Basically, the, the, the picture was made in December. So they're probably just 10 months old or even less. And you see how fast they grow, how happy they are. They have perfect uh, colors, spines. And basically, I grow them uh, in the pumice based mix, as you can see on the picture, just uh, a view from the, from the side, from the bottom. And as you see, there is almost no organic material, and the plants are uh, absolutely happy to grow. And you see the roots. There's still some black stuff here, that's why. I'm saying that uh, you need uh, some organic material just for the uh, for the young plants because they grow hair roots mainly uh, into the organics. Because if you use uh, just 100% mineral uh, soil mix, it will be drying too fast, and you have to basically water your plants very often. But then you might just uh, get them rotten. Or in, uh, in my case, I, I just prefer to add some organic, as I mentioned. Uh, any question about soils? No? Okay. Uh, watering, it's pretty common. Uh, Gymnocalisums are pretty drought resistant because they have uh, like big bodies with thick wax-like epidermis. And uh, they don't evaporate water too much at all. But again, in summer, in the growing period, uh, I'm watering them maybe uh, like once a week, one in, once in ten days, uh, like uh, with, and especially small uh, small plants, uh, just waiting for for the soil to dry out. If I see that the soil is dry, then I'm okay to water them again. Uh, like, however, in the dormancy, something from like end of September to March, 
uh, in my case, because I'm staying in the greenhouse where it's pretty cold, like maybe now it's plus five plus seven Celsius only, and they stay there all winter. I don't give them a drop of water through the like all dormancy period. So five, six months a year, they stay absolutely dry and they survive. They never shrink too much as other species or as other uh, genus of cacti. So they're pretty good and pretty durable plants. Uh, for the winter, it's kind of uh, some specifics about Gymnocalypsum. As I said, some of them are uh, the origin of some of the species is uh, from very low altitude, close to Atlantic Ocean. It's pretty much tropical climate. They don't see any low temperature over there. And for that group of Gymnocalypsum, uh, I would say the lowest temperature might be around 10 Celsius, that's it. For the winter. For some of them which are growing uh, close to the Andes and high altitudes, uh, definitely they have colder, uh, colder winter temperatures or, or, or the, those plants. They're not hardy for sure, but they can, uh, they can survive in the temperature like plus three, plus four Celsius, like without any damage to the plants. Uh, basically, uh, this is the setup of my greenhouse, pretty old one. What I was saying is that uh, basically I split my plants into certain groups, and the ones which require high temperature, I put them on top shelf somewhere, or at least over here, close to the heater. The plants which uh, tolerant to low temperature. I put them, some of them just on the floor, some of them on the far away uh, from the heater. And uh, just to make sure that there is no obviously uh, like temperature below freezing, but just how I do the setup for the winter. Uh, uh, what I would like to say uh, about Gymnocalypsum, like with regard to the temperature, that it's a well known fact that Gymnocalypsum, the same as Parodia or not a cactus, they tend to go to summer dormancy. Basically, uh, summer dormancy is uh, when the temperature is getting too high. For example, in my house, if I know that it will be like 45, 40, seven degrees Celsius, I would expect my gymnocalypsum and parodia to stop growing in, in, in dormancy. So like, again, there is nothing wrong with it. If you see your plants going to dormancy in the middle of summer, just let it rest. Don't try to water them, because if, it, if you will start just watering them to push them to grow, you will just kill the plant anyway. Because after the temperature, uh, will go down somewhere in August, you see that the plants will go back to, uh, to the growth, you will see new flower buds, new spines coming, then you can start with human water. Uh, what you can do basically is uh, to cover uh, your balcony or your, or your greenhouse, whenever you grow them, uh, with a shade cloth, just to screen the sun. And uh, this way, uh, the sun would not uh, heat too much and uh, the plants will stay uh, kind of in more uh, low temperatures area. And in this case, yeah, they can grow uh, like without any, 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 summer, any summer dormancy. This is what I do like last couple of years or three years, something like end of June or like the beginning of July. I cover all my greenhouse with a shade course and keep it for three, four, five weeks until I, I see at least the night temperature will go on down. Then okay, I'll I remove the cloth and uh, in August, September, plants are still flowering and growing. Uh, I don't have that summer break for them. Uh, lights are pretty 
uh, specific for gymnasts. Also, as I said, uh, from tropical areas uh, of South America, uh, in the places they grow, they grow uh, the command grasses and shrubs. This is the kind of common place where people find gymnocalypsums. And that's why uh, we're actually trying to avoid uh, direct sunlight. And this is a, a, a key to understand when you when you grow your gymnocalypsum in the greenhouse, you don't have to put them on the brightest spot, whether uh, like under the direct sunlight. They are okay to stay in a, to stay in semi shade. They will keep flowering. They will have perfect shape, shape like body shape, even being uh, like like away from the full sun. Uh, like especially, it's very uh, like tricky situation when you bring them out of dormancy. Uh, it's very easy to get sunburns on gymnocalypsums like specifically because yeah. last last summer I have many plants of gymnocalypsum with sunburns, which can basically I probably will not recover and I might compose them because those sunburns are just they uh, sunburns, they just destroy the plants completely. Uh, Propagation, again, two ways. One is uh, uh, by cuttings or offsets. There are many uh, species of gymnocalypsum which produce a lot of offsets. Like uh, this is just an example uh, of gymnocalypsum colachlorum. If I report it, I might have like 20, 30 heads. I can place them in different pots. And the, this way it's easier to, uh, to to propagate some of them. However, for most of gymnocalypsum, sowing uh, seeds is the only way to, uh, to, to propagate the plants. Now, I just found that many people mentioned that gymnocalypsum seeds, uh, they're, they're losing uh, germination very quickly. So they don't recommend to keep them for a long time, more than five years, for example. But I have some seeds, that's why I put this uh, slide on. Those are the seeds of Dinokaritsum uh, Mihanovicha, which I, which I collected in 2015. In 2015, and this winter, I started sowing them and they germinate them uh, like crazy. They, they're okay to stay uh, and and to be stored for more than five years, I am positive about it. Uh, this is just a close up. And you see those small seeds, uh, they pop up very, very small, tiny bodies of gymnocalypsum, but don't be confused, they will grow very fast. Uh, I have, I believe this is a picture of a gymnocalypse from uh, Saglionis seedlings. They're just 18 months old and the seeds are so tiny and first couple of months I couldn't even see them just without the magnifying glass. And then after two, three months, they start growing like crazy. They just double in the size, double in the size like every few weeks and after one year or like 18 months, you have plants which uh, looks like almost mature. If you if you compare it with other uh, species, uh, with other uh, cacti. When I saw my gymnocalypsum, again, nothing specific, just uh, regular sterile uh, soil uh, for sowing cacti. I use just to screen it to make uh, just just to remove big fraction. I add some coarse soil or again small fractions of pumice to the soil, and I keep them in a moist place with a temperature 20, 27 Celsius, uh, and they and they grow very well. As I mentioned, they don't need too much light, so any artificial kind of light like LED or fluorescent lights, 
will be absolutely perfect for growing chemicals in top seeds. If you grow them on the window sill, don't leave them under the direct sunlight because again, you might see sunburns after a couple of hours on the on the like actual uh, sunlight. Uh, next, uh, I'm just going to uh, to show a kind of uh, like a collection of plants from my greenhouse. Uh, First is very nice, very beautiful Gymnocalizzo, which is a Laurianum. Nice plant, very flat, bluish body, and very beautiful plant. I love it. Another one is a Brunecke. Again, plant itself is very big. It's about maybe whew, six, seven inches in diameter now. But what I like about that plant is the color of the flower. So beautiful. I said Glatzum flowers in like five, six, seven, ten flowers in a day. It's like a bush, flowering bush. Here's just another picture of the same plant. And it flowers like that all summer, all summer. Like maybe one week break, another bunch of flowers, another one two weeks another bunch of flowers so beautiful very nice plant i love them this is a haridispino very uh, cute very like uh, large light pink flowers oh, again this is very famous uh mihanovich eye and this is just another picture of mihanovich eye flowers uh, some of them have almost white flowers. I have a bunch of them growing. Some of them has pretty, have pretty uh, like dark pink flowers, which uh, which I like more. Very attractive plant. This is how the cultivar flowering. The plant itself is beautiful, and the flowers are just amazing. I, I just I just go in and just to grow a, like like another bunch of them from seed see how they look like but so beautiful palm you don't have to graft it grow on its own roots different colors different variegations beautiful palm this is just uh organize the eye and you see the flower bud and the flower it never grows up it's only grows sidewise uh, the biggest plant I have, maybe about inch, inch and a half. Very miniature plant, never grow big, but keep flowering and flowering and flowering. Uh, Gymnocalizum mostia. This is Cochlean, beautiful plant. Very small, tiny spines, but so nice uh, flower color, which I love. All pinkish. This is just a picture of another Gymnocalizum. Uh, I'm afraid I cannot pronounce its name again. <laughs> it has strong, long spines. It looks like like a Hemopsis phallus or something like that, but still very beautiful. This is a Tilianum, which is a red flowering one. And very nice, very cute plant. It's uh, also Gymnocalizum. And I, I have this plant for many years. It's pretty big. It's so uh, seven, eight, eight inches across. That's why flowers look small, but they're not actually small if you compare it uh, with something else. This is one of my favorite Cardinazian. Again, flowering uh, from May to, to September. Flowers are quite different, depends on the uh, spacement. I have them, one of them is almost white, another one much, much darker flowers, but very nice plant. This is my favorite actually plant and I have grown them from seeds now because I'd like to like to see the whole variety of spines because some of them will be 
will have absolutely dark brown or maybe even black spines. Some of them like this have very light yellow spines and the body can be just just green green or it could be dark green or it could be very almost blue body like very beautiful very good i love them okay and that is it about the mechanisms <laughs>